So, Rob McCann, you're with Clear Cable. Um, tell us a little bit more about what Clear Cable does and how it's structured compared to a lot of our audience in the U.S. who understand U.S. providers. Yeah, so Clear Cable really isn't a provider, but more a supplier to providers, meaning that we help ISPs, cable companies, telephone companies, and municipalities build out their broadband infrastructure. And so you work with cities? But also, who else are your clients? I know you work with school districts, and tell us a little bit more about the client base. Yeah, it's pretty much anybody who is trying to build out a broadband network to get connectivity between uh, subscribers and the internet. And what's this, what's a typical day look look like for you, Rob? Well, in my role, I look mostly at strategy. So I'm thinking about what's happening with the networks today is what is the growth? What are the new applications? How can we build in order to solve these types of problems? And then we have an implementation team who goes off and builds those actual implementation plans and executes. And then once it's all built and executed, they support it. Interesting. And so pre-COVID, were you traveling much to meet with cities like in Kansas and elsewhere? Absolutely. I mean, probably the biggest dent has been on the conference budget, right? <laughs> we, spent, <laughs> we spent a lot of time going to different conferences, talking to lots of different people, trying to understand their challenges and, and come up with the right solutions. But all of that has simply gone away. So today there's more of these kinds of meetings one-on-one -on -one over video chat. Are you finding it's still driving forward work and strategy decisions, or do you find it slowing things down? Well, we're fortunate in that broadband is needed, so there's a, a period of growth right now. The question will be if this ex continues to extend on, will we get into a place where people can't afford broadband anymore and, and they start to drop off and the economy shrinks for us? So, so today, Plenty of work to do. Working from home is working just fine. Into the future, if we don't get things under control, that might change. There's a lot of discussion around broadband with COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. and work from home, online distance learning, but tell us a little bit more about what you think makes broadband so important right now. Well, even before the pandemic, you know, in 2016, the Intelligent Community Forum declared broadband as an essential service, just as important as good roads and clean water and reliable power. So we knew that, that broadband was transforming the way that cities operate. It was bringing more opportunities for education, for training, for jobs, for entertainment. And, and it's something that we need to expand further. And I think everybody recognizes that. But what the yeah. pandemic really drove home for us is that now we've shifted so many people to their homes that it's important to keep them connected because some folks are literally locked in their house. So they do need the broadband to be able to continue their education, to continue entertainment, and to be connected to family and friends. You've written uh, some articles and one is talking about how internet consumption is at an unprecedented high. Um, how, does, how have you guys at Clear Cable pivoted so quickly to accommodate so much usage? So the interesting thing is that we've observed since the early 2000s that the usage of broadband was growing at about 50% compound growth annually. And that really happened up until about 2018. And service providers were typically building that investment into their networks. But over the last two years, that's come down to more like about 35%. So there was some capacity available in our broadband networks when the pandemic hit. And we instantly saw the traffic grow by 25%. So we jumped back up to all the savings that we had for the last couple of years, we took that away. And that happened exactly on March the 13th, right across the continent. So everybody shifted to home and they started to do more online. What's interesting is as the warmer months came along, we have saw that wane down a little bit. Folks are getting outside, they're enjoying the parks, you know, they're, they're 
doing what they need to do outside. But we think that when we get back into the colder weather, we're going to see that growth come right back up again. You, you're across all these geographies, urban, suburban, sounds like rural too. What's the difference you're seeing in urban versus suburban rural access and usage? Well, when people are building networks, at least commercially, if it's not the municipality or city doing it, they tend to do that for investment purposes, right? They want to get subscribers. They want to get a return on that investment. So they tend to service the more densely populated areas. They can get more customers for the investment that they put in the ground. The big challenge in the rural market is that the customers are so spread out that it really takes a significant investment in network to be able to service those customers. So it's not really as profitable. And that's where we often see cities, rural municipalities step up to help de-risk the service providers, either by you know, providing some infrastructure for the broadband service providers to use, or in many cases, directly entering the market as either an open access network or uh, a fully competitive ISP themselves. Oh, wow. Interesting. And do, are you seeing rural towns doing this as quickly as possible due to the pandemic? Has there been a rise in interest or to, to fill the digital divide? But, or was it already going on pre-pandemic? Has the pandemic been an accelerant? Yeah. So I, this has been happening all across North America communities figuring out that they need to solve this problem in order to keep their citizens staying at home, right? The worst thing that can happen to a community is that the young people grow up and they leave the community and eventually they're in population decline. So we like to try to keep people working where they were born and where they live. And and that's, you know, broadband allows that to happen. It allows people to, to work from anywhere. So if, uh -huh. we can, if we can do that in the rural market, we can keep the population, we can continue a robust community. So that was already happening, but the pandemic really just drives home the point that, you know, we have to make these connections. And the other interesting observation we've seen is that some people are starting to migrate out of the cities. You know, for a long time, we've talked about everybody's moving to the cities. So much of the population is in the city. But I think the pandemic is making people rethink that a little bit. If I can get broadband in a rural community where I can live you know, you know, on a wide open space, then I can live and work in that place as long as I'm connected. You and I have talked a little bit about 5G in the past. Um, is it a real solution, do you think, for high-speed broadband? Or what's the future of broadband access um, that's fast and affordable? Fast and affordable, yeah. So the interesting part about 5G for us is that we do see it as a great opportunity in the urban centers. The reality is the real high-speed stuff uses a frequency range that has a very short distance, which means we need to have lots and lots of antennas and those and transmitters, and those need to be connected on fiber networks. So in a dense area, that's possible to do. But in a rural area where you have large expanses and you have lots of trees and lots of hills and such, 5G doesn't make quite as much sense. So I think we're still going to see you know, fixed wireless technologies similar to the ones we use today in the rural markets while we see 5G in the urban markets.